So, where are we going to start? Number one, uh, we're not going to go through the whole test. If you want to go through the whole test, I'm absolutely 100% okay with that, not in class. Um, we, I'm starting to get a bit panic-stricken with where we're at timing-wise for finishing out the semester. Um, we got about six weeks left, including this one, and we've got a bunch of content that we still need to kind of burn through. Um, at this point, everything that we're talking about is just an application of everything backwards. Okay? So practice is going to become critical um, to the weekly practice assignments. Um, for this first unit, I think it's really just going to be two. So I went through and did for the substitution section is I just recorded, or not recorded, went through the question stack that I've got access to um, and pulled out as many questions as I could. I think it was somewhere on the order of 20 or 30 questions. Um, we'll still have active and we'll still do the paper homework. You just have that more practice available. And so we can do some of those in class. We'll talk through some of that chemistry, all that kind of fun stuff. And then next week should be the elimination reaction. The following week is, I think, going to be the exam. I've got to look exactly at the schedule. Um, but it, it might be that following week or maybe one week after that. I think it's one week after that, actually. Um, I think it's the week of Thanksgiving. And then we get two weeks afterwards. And those two weeks afterwards are just going to be crammed just as much, if not more, with more reactions, looking at all our functional groups and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay would argue you've got what I really wanted you to get out of the class already. Now it's just looking at specific reactions, right? And those particular functional groups. Um, so if it feels like the pace is picking up, it is. It is. Um, and for the substitution stuff, that's also why I threw a whole bunch of videos at you um, to try and get you some of that background content so we can start looking at how we apply that content into those scenarios. Um, questions about the exam? Anybody have any burning questions? I'll give you, uh, what are we going to say? 10 minutes of recording, total of 10 minutes. So I get eight minutes total left. Is there anything you want to look at? Just a moment, anybody else? We don't have to, it's okay. And we can always do it in office hours or via email, any of that fun stuff. Like I said, I wish I remembered more about the actual test, but the, the other class got me down enough that I really don't remember much other than I think the average came in at like a 70%, which is really high for an OCHEM test. So I think you all did very, very well. Doesn't mean you didn't get wrong. It doesn't mean you all can't improve, just for the record. Okay. Um, you just did very well overall. Um, questions about grades too. The post exam two grade is put in there. Don't be looking at what Canvas spits out. Canvas spits out nonsense. Don't look at what Canvas says. Okay, but there's a grade, a column, or an entry in your assignments called post exam two, or post E two. That's your grade as I see it in the class. Okay. We still have another exam to kind of come in the way or come in the way. Um, we've got one more exam to deal with and then we have the final. The final does replace. So if this was a low score, figure out what went wrong, where the disconnect is, and make sure that you fix those mistakes by the time exam three rolls. And then uh, the final is gonna be a repeat of everything. Where I'll start the final is actually pulling questions immediately off of old exams first and then I'll start adding new content questions in. Okay. Are we blanket passing on everything in exam two? I mean, I'm cool with that. Okay. So. Uh, not that button. I want this button. So really what we're concerned about is our substitution and elimination um, reaction and mechanisms and kind of digging into the details behind them. For those people in lab, we did a lab that explicitly talked about some of these pieces. 
but the only place you saw it was in lab, and I don't think there was really enough context to really make that kind of stick and hold. So hopefully as we talk through it in class, it'll reinforce those words that were kind of thrown at you in lab and bring a little more sense to it. If you aren't in lab, well, good luck. It's not that bad. Okay. <clears throat> so if we go through, ultimately what we're talking about in the format for all of these reactions is we're taking a starting material, some kind of carbon-containing structure, and that carbon-containing structure has what I've labeled as an LG, which I believe we've talked about is our leaving group. That thing needs to take the electrons away from our carbon structure. Okay, so that's our leaving group. This thing that we're starting with is typically referred to as the substrate. Okay. We then address the nucleophile or base, which is kind of our secondary reagent that goes with this. Because our substrate does technically include the leaving group. And then we've got our reagent as a nucleophile or base. Less important, but it does make a, a role in an appearance. The solvent will come into play in some scenarios. It's going to play a relatively minor role as far as our class goes because I, I just don't think we need the emphasis on the solvent. Um, but that said, we now have four kind of pieces, and how those pieces change is going to change some of the chemistry that we'd be looking at. Right. So we've got our solvent, we've got what I'm labeling right now is just reagent. This is either a nucleophile or base. And then we have our substrate, which contains the leaving group. Right. When we change the identity of the leaving group, that changes the identity of that functional group. And when we look at the classic kind of definitions of how reactions are set up, or how organic chemistry is set up, is that we would go through and we would change it. We could start this with a bromine. Well, now if it's a bromine, this is an alkyl halide. Well, what chemistry do we have? Well, alkyl halides can go through all this chemistry, okay? Because the bromine, being large and relatively electronegative, is able to suck the electrons away from the carbon to stabilize them as a good leaving group, which then allows all this other chemistry to come into play, okay? So we could look at alkyl halides. We could also go through and say, well, what if that was an oxygen? If it's an oxygen, oxygen needs two bonds, so we could throw in another H on there. Well, now it's an alcohol. Okay. Is oxygen electronegative? Yeah. Could it withdraw electrons from the carbon? Yeah. Okay. So when we now look at this, we'd look at the alcohol chapter, and what does the alcohol chapter do? All the same bloom and reactions, because it can still have that same functionality. Okay. If we push this further, it didn't have to be an H out there. It could have been some kind of carbon structure. So we could just say an R group. Well, now it's not an alcohol. It's not an alkyl halide. It's an ether. Can the oxygen still suck the electrons away? Yeah. Which then means all of this chemistry is available to us. And so what we end up finding is a lot of redundancy within the textbook. So they go, oh, alkyl halides do this chemistry. Yay. And then they move to the alcohol chapter and say, alcohol, alcohols do this chemistry. You mean the same chemistry we are? Yeah. Let's talk about it all again. Yay! Let's move to ethers. Oh, they do all this chemistry. And it's like it's this new thing each and every single time. It's not new. It's the same principles all the way through. And that's why I try to push those principles so that you can just make minor modifications and say what's happening at each of those stages. Okay, so what we will see through most of this unit when we talk about the nitrogenerics is we're just going to say leaving group. Okay? But that leaving group can be a variety of different things. Okay? What we need to be responsible for or what we're responsible for is acknowledging what allows it to be a leaving group. And we just addressed a couple concepts. What were those couple concepts we said were important for leaving groups? Okay? The leaving group, by definition, takes electrons. Okay? Why would it take electrons? Yes, it breaks the bond, but why would that atom take electrons? Okay. Now what we're trying to think about is what are the properties of the leaving group that would allow it to take those electrons, to allow it to break that bond. Okay. It's usually more electronegative. Okay. And electronegativity we show with that chi, that X symbol. Okay. What else? 
I said it. went fast. I said a lot of things. It's big. It's big. Okay. So what we're talking about is a species taking electrons. Okay. We're going to make a subtle adjustment here. It's bigger, more electronegative. Okay. It takes electrons. What would happen if it took electrons? It would become charged. And if it's bigger, what are we talking about? And if we're talking about electronegativity, well, we're talking about electronegativity. What else could contribute to the leaving group being able to take those electrons? Resonance, induction. Those same principles that we talk about as far as reactivity apply to our leaving groups. Right? The exact same principle. There's no new thing that comes out. We're still using those same rules. Okay? If you watch videos online, which I know everybody's doing, that's okay. But what you'll hear people reference when they talk about leaving group is, oh, it's a weak base. What's a base? How does it accept H pluses? Okay. What they're saying by a weak base is they've said, let's memorize a bunch of weak bases so that we don't have to apply a bunch of rules. You go, okay, I understand that. That's because these rules only work in that one case? No, they work in every Blumen case, which means stop making people memorize their weak bases and just apply the same flipping rules we've been applying since day one. Okay? Push the repetition because the repetition reinforces itself. Okay? That's one of the things that we'll find when we're looking at leaving groups. Okay. The next part is how it happens. Because okay? when we look beginning to end in each of these cases, okay, the extreme, something has changed. Okay. If we look at the top two scenarios, what's happened? What happened when I look at my starting substrate and I compare them to the end? The top two result in the same structure. What happened to the starting material to make that happen? What changed? What kind of reaction is that? Uh, that's a substitution. Okay. Depending on how the substitution happens, there's different pathways we could take. We're getting the exact same product, but we get it in different ways. Does it matter? It depends. Right? And it's going to depend on lots of secondary factors. One of those big factors when we're talking about our substitution pathway is actually already up here. When we take a look at these products, is there anything special about that product? Let's just take a look at this one. Believe it or not, we've asked this question before, and it sucked then just as much as it sucks now as a question. Do we see anything special about that product? There is a nucleophile on it, yeah. Oh, it <laughs> You want a hint? Yeah. This is where you should be looking. That's why I wasn't there. So there's a, a secondary carbon. We can reference this as secondary because it is connected to two carbons. I do accept that. What was that? No, that's okay. Ah, it's chiral. Which means this nucleophile could be wedged or dashed. That would result in two different products. Okay. How do I know whether it's wedged or dashed? Well, that's going to be dependent on all of this process. All the way back to the beginning, it was still chiral there. Was the leaving group wedged or dashed? How did the reaction run? Did it form a carbocation or did it all happen at once? Right? So chirality as a concept is going to come back and haunt us because it manifests in how a reaction happens. Yay! See, it's like it stacks. Kind of, sort of? What happens in the bottom case? We move to the bottom case, we'll notice the formation of a pi bond, so we might refer to those as elimination reactions. How are they different from our substitution? 
Go ahead. You can say the easy answer. A pi bond formed. Okay, fair play. Okay, after that, how are they different? There was no nucleophile. Okay, a nucleophile didn't come in and do a substitution. Why not? Because it's an elimination. Did I still have something that acts like a nucleophile? What does a nucleophile do? Define nucleophile. Donates electrons. Define base. Hydrogen ion acceptor. By doing what? Donating electrons. Do we still have a nucleus? Yeah, the base and the nucleophile are very much related. Okay? But in this case, the base, are, we're looking at that, that thing that's sharing electrons, but it's changing what it's sharing electrons with. In the case of the elimination, we're sharing electrons with? In the case of the elimination, we're sharing the electrons with? The base is the one sharing the electrons. What does the base share electrons with? An acid, I accept that. I wanted something a little bit different, but acid, what is an acid? Didn't hear you. You wanna try? No, uh, you're using more fancy terms. I want less fancy terms. What is an acid? A hydrogen ion donor. The base shares its electrons with the hydrogen. So in the course of doing the elimination, that base is going to remove a hydrogen so that I can make the pi bond. Because if we compare our starting structures, let's clean up this first structure here. That's ultimately where our leaving group was, right? Okay, well, the leaving group left, fine. If we look at this position, what changed at the red dot? Another sigma bond? It's not a sigma bond. If anything, it's a pi bond. That red dot at the very beginning only has two electrons or four electrons around it, which means there's two hydrogens. When we look to that same carbon in our product, how many electrons do we see around it? Two, four, six, which means one hydrogen. In the case of the elimination, we're removing a hydrogen and the leaving group. Remember when I told you to memorize elimination and what it was? It was the formation of a pi bond by doing what? Breaking two sigma bonds. Breaking two sigma bonds. The leaving group and hydrogen. Those taken together do our elimination. How, again, that happens changes the potential outcome. It's much harder to see the potential outcome with the elimination, particularly on the context of how we've discussed it. So we're not going to worry about that one quite yet because I really want to dig into the substitution because that's what this week is supposed to be about, our substitution reactions. But this sets up our kind of overview behind it. We could look at energy diagrams. Uh, mixed bag, it's probably not worth the trouble for this class, so I wouldn't stress about it. Okay? But what we're concerned about is what's happening as this nucleophile comes in. Does it come in and make the chemistry all happen at once? Okay. Or does the chemistry happen on its own first, then the nucleophile come in? That could change the outcome around that chiral atom, and that's what we kind of have to push on. When we look at OCHEM, what we're talking about with these mechanisms gets into this how it happens. This is the philosophical versus chemical approach. Okay. Philosophically, yes, we should care how something happens. Okay? That's largely for organic chemists, okay? or maybe even chemists in general. Do you all really care philosophically how it happens? No. Do we care chemically? Okay? Well, that's going to, again, kind of depend. If there's now a difference between those two products, and we're saying, I don't know, administering a drug, okay? or we know something about that drug, if that's a chiral atom, and both drugs are being administered, and one of them is toxic and the other one isn't, that's something that you should care about. That's a chemical process that you could then ultimately be held responsible for. Okay? Kind of make sense? Hi. Okay.
fix that. So when we're talking about our functional groups that are relevant to our substitution and our elimination reactions, okay? Remember our substrate had our leaving group on it, okay? Well, what's an alkyl halide? An alkyl halide is a carbon structure. Is this a carbon structure? Yeah. yeah? Except I don't want LG, I want any of my halogens. So when we're talking about substitution and elimination, we're directly addressing our alkyl halide functional group. Okay? We could talk about our alcohols. That's now with the OH. That's changing the functional group again. It still matches that pattern of the leaving group. Okay? We switched that to an ether, right? Where we had an R group. Okay? Same basic kind of chemistry, or I shouldn't say basic, same core chemistry, okay? and we're just scaffolding it slightly differently. Yes, things will get complicated as we move through. What happens if we move to an amine? What if I put a nitrogen there? Okay. Could it still act as a leaving group? Yeah, it's also equally electronegative. How about a carbon? What do you think? That is way too cagey of an answer. You gotta elaborate that. You can't just say depends. If it has the electrons, if it's willing to take the electrons from the carbon structure. Why would a carbon be willing to take electrons from a carbon? Because it's a carbon. Why was bromine willing to take electrons away from the carbon? It's more electronegative. Why was oxygen willing to take the electrons away from the carbon? Why was nitrogen willing to take the electrons away from the carbon? Like, more electronegative. More electronegative. Get to your point. Yeah. Would carbon be willing to take the electrons away from carbon? Mm -hmm. It's not more electronegative. It's not different in size. So what happens? It doesn't. Okay. We don't get that chemistry. Unless we add something else to change that, and we'll maybe address that later on, okay? But at a simple level, if that's just carbon, we don't talk about our substitution reactions because it doesn't act as a leaving group. It can't stabilize those electrons. What functional group have I addressed by making a carbon-carbon bond? Okay. An alkane. You'll note that our alkanes are going to be rarely talked about. Why? Why don't they react? There's no difference in electronegativity. So it goes all the way back to the beginning. We're trying to find those polar covalent bonds because those were where our chemistry was located. So if we can establish those things, we can start to scaffold out and predict and guess what could potentially come out of this. That's pretty cool and powerful. Okay? You'll also note that I listed alkenes. Okay? So there's our bromide. We're talking about our substitution and elimination reactions. We'll talk about our alkenes. What was an alkene? A carbon-carbon pi bond. But dude, that doesn't have a leaving group. How is that substitution? It's not. Why would we talk about alkenes then? It's the product of that reaction when we're looking at our eliminations. It was the formation of that pi bond. Okay? So as a functional group, it's now appearing in our chemistry list as well because it's the product. It's appearing in our reaction. And if it appears in our reaction, when we talk about the functional group chemistries, that's what we're doing. We're saying, oh, this functional group appeared here, so that means its chemistry should now be discussed. Okay? What I would like you to kind of step back from is not the, the chemistry of the functional groups per se, but what's the reaction that I could see that functional group either doing or becoming? Okay. Alkynes, I've also got, what's an alkyne? Triple A triple bond between carbons. Why would alkynes be listed in this? The alkene was the formation of a pi bond. What's an alkyne? Potentially, the formation of just one pi bond going from an alkene to an alkyne, or 
the formation of two pi bonds, so two eliminations to make the alkyne. It still fits within that chemistry. Kind of, sort of? Okay. Okay. So now let's actually drill into our substitution mechanism. Okay. If we're looking at an overall substitution reaction, what's happening? Okay, the nucleophile is replacing the leaving group. That's putting everything together in one giant hodgepodge and it's kind of difficult to understand what's happening. Okay? Because is the nucleophile doing anything per se to the leaving group? No. What is the nucleophile doing? After suggesting something about timing. I don't care about timing. What must the nucleophile do to make this reaction happen? Donate electrons. To hydrogen? Okay. What the nucleophile has to do is to create that bond. So the nucleophile is making, we're talking about a bond making between the nucleophile and our carbon. What else has to happen in this reaction? The leaving group needs to take the electrons away from our carbon, which means we have broken a carbon leaving group bond. Right? And if we look at the very top, this is saying breaking CI bond, then forming CCL. Okay? Those words don't really align with the reaction shown. I, if we're talking about breaking CI, what do you think that I is supposed to be? Okay, Break and break, that I is supposed to be a leaving group. Then forming CCL. What is the CL? That was our nucleophile. Okay. So that breaking CI, then forming CCL... Okay, was really just in reference to a specific example. Okay, what we're trying to do is break this down into generalities that we could then overlay on top of specific examples. Okay, we have two things that have to happen. I have to make a nucleophile and, then, and break a carbon leaving group bond. Both of those things have to happen. When they happen is what's setting the stage for the different mechanisms. Okay. For the SN1, what we are deciding is that those two things happen at different times. First we do one, then we do the other. Okay. Would it make sense to make the carbon nucleophile bond first? Why not? Okay. If the carbon nucleophile bond was made first, we exceed the octet. That doesn't make sense. So if we're going to break this down into steps, the very first thing that's going to happen is we need to break that carbon leaving group bond. We can show that with the curved arrow. That curved arrow is taking the electrons from that bond and giving them to the, nucle or to the leaving group. What would our resulting structure look like? Three carbons. What's that? Positive charge where? The carbon should be positively charged. Why do you think the leaving group should be negative? Kind of accept that it took the electrons. That doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. There's another thing you're assuming to make the leaving group negative. There's getting at the right answer. That when we looked at our starting structure, what was the charge on the leaving group? It was neutral. Did it have to be neutral? No. no. What if that leaving group started positive? Well, that's not in a pen. What if our leaving group started positive? Then it would be neutral. Then it would be neutral. Which would be better, a negative leaving group or a neutral leaving group? There's some pauses there, and I guess those pauses could have to do with visualizing what we're talking about. So we've got the scenario drawn 
there. Let's look at another scenario on the left. We're ignoring that. I should have used an eraser. Which of these reactions do you think is better? Left or right? right. Why is the right one better? You're going back to those same rule sets. There's less charge. Okay. Does this actually manifest as a problem? Yes, it absolutely does. If I start with an alcohol, that OH, my leaving group is then OH with the extra electrons on it. That would be negatively charged. If I wanted this to actually work, I would need that oxygen to be positively charged, so I could protonate it first. When I protonate it, what becomes the leaving group? It's water. If we now overlay, remember I said something about leaving groups, that when you look online, people reference leaving groups as? Weak bases. Which is the weaker base? Hydroxide or water? What? Why is it a weaker base? It's not charged. It's not negative. Okay. The charge fixes that issue. It's not as basic as that one. Okay. So this is a better mechanism to move through. Okay. Kind of make sense? Cool. Let's go back to our leaving group. Of course, I used the wrong eraser. So cool, we've run our reaction. We've got our leaving group now, chilling out here, with those extra electrons. Because it started neutral, we're gonna say it's negative. Now what happens? The nucleophile needs to come in. Okay. So what does the nucleophile do to come in? So we take the lone pair of electrons from our nucleophile and we share them inwards. We now have a bond between the nucleophile and our carbon structure. What charge was the nucleophile? Neutral. Neutral, which means here it is positive. Do we like charges? No. No, so what happens? To become Less positive, what does it need? Electrons. electrons. Where could it get electrons from? If we have the leaving group come in, we're now making another bond. Oh. How about our leaving group comes in, pulls the hydrogen, and it shuttles those electrons to our nucleophile? Okay. What happens? Now we've got our result. There's some stuff being implied in here that we don't, I haven't given you context for. Okay? Typically, when we talk about this version of mechanism, the nucleophile is neutral. Okay? And if it's neutral, is it as good a nucleophile? No, why not? The nucleophile needs to donate electrons. If I want it to be a strong, good nucleophile, I want it to be negatively charged, going back to that list of rules. Okay? Typically, when we talk about this me me mechanism, it's neutral, though. Okay? What does that usually mean? That usually means that before we officially hit our final answer, we have to do some kind of acid-base step to fix it, okay? to undo the nucleophile's less strong activity. What does this mean now overarching for our system? Right? That nucleophile went in and formed a bond. What did it form the bond with? Three carbons? Three carbons? Three so if I add a carbon there, that changes all of the chemistry? No. no. What did it form the bond with? If I add a double bond over here, is it an alkane anymore? No. Does that change the chemistry? Okay. 
Where's the chemistry happening? Yes, it's a three carbon structure. What is the nucleophile forming a bond with? Carbon. That positively charged carbon. Do I care anything about the rest of the structure? No. This is one of the reasons why OCHEM becomes challenging. Because you say, oh, it's the three carbon structure. No, it's not. It's that carbon. Because I can change that. That didn't affect this, which then means it is irrelevant. Focus where the chemistry is happening. Don't worry about the rest. Much easier said than done, but that's something you need to be thinking about when you look at your reactions. Okay? We got to make it harder, though. What part of the carbon is the nucleophile reacting with? Is that a hard question? Should be a pretty hard question. Okay. So if we looked at that carbon, let's expand it a little bit. So there's our carbon. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I decided sound effects were appropriate. Okay. What? This, this, this. Are those green dots carbons? No. No. So what am I trying to show by those extra colors? Where are the electrons are The electrons on our carbon, right? So if I'm asking where this nucleophile is reacting, what am I asking about is it reacting? Is it reacting with the sp2 hydro or electrons in this carbon-carbon bond? No, is it reacting with the sp2 electrons in this carbon-hydrogen bond? How about the electrons in that carbon? So what is it reacting with? With the what? But which part of that carbon? Is it the 1s electrons it's reacting with? No. What is it reacting with? Where's the positive charge? That's lovely. Where the electrons aren't. Yes. Where is that positive charge? Is it in a space that we can identify? Oh, that's so bad. Back, backward, back something. Uh, oh. Different mechanism. Kind of the right idea. Like an open P. Ah. When we go through to look at a molecule, we want to know where all the electrons are located for that individual molecule. This is where we looked at hybridization theory. And if we had a carbon with three groups of electrons, it was sp2 hybridized, meaning we used an s and two of the p's. Those orbitals are what were used to make those three bonds. Carbon started with four orbitals. I can't destroy matter. What happened to that fourth orbital? It's still there. It's still there. What is the identity of that fourth orbital? It's a p orbital. Where's the nucleophile reacting? The empty p orbital. Like, dude, Mike, I don't care. Why does that matter? Where is the empty p orbital? On the carbon. I, uh, okay. <laughs> Fair point. More. Also, kind of where the positive charge is. No. What does a p orbital look like? Dumbbell. Yeah, the drumstick is more like the SP hybrids. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So dumbbell. Where would I draw the dumbbell on this? Uh, the drum always confused. Ah. So this becomes one of our issues with hybridization. And why we talk about that hybridization theory so we understand where those orbitals are at and what they are. Because when we talk about this reaction happening, I'm talking about putting these electrons into that p orbital. And if I know where that p orbital is, guess what else I know? Where that new bond is located. And if I don't know where that orbital is, what am I resigning myself to do? Plop it anywhere. I can't just plop it anywhere, though. I have to plop it in one of the correct spaces. So if I've decided that I don't know anything about that, those hybrid orbitals or where they are in three dimensions, 
what I'm resigning myself to do is that when I know I have an SN1 mechanism, I know the nucleophile goes in this particular location. Said another way, I've decided to memorize my way out. That's okay. But that's what you need to acknowledge behind this. Kind of make sense? Like, so where's the location? Where is the location? Okay. Where is the P orbital? Let's say you were starting to make hand gestures. Usually well, the hand gestures could be like curses. Isn't it this, this smaller? There's no smaller lobe. That's the drumstick. If I was to draw a P orbital, okay, a P orbital would look kind of like this. Theoretically, those lobes are identical. What does a solid line mean in our drawings? It's all on the same plane. When we look at the sp2 hybrid, all three of those bonds are in the plane of the paper. Where's the remaining p orbital? Coming in and out of the plane. It is perpendicular to it. Okay. Drawing it here would look really awful, right? Because how do I draw a p orbital? I'd be looking at this from the top. All you would see is a circle. So what we could do is slightly take this structure and we could rotate it a little bit. And in rotating it, what we might go through and see is that those hydrogens would now, one of them would be coming at me and one of them would be going away. So we took that flat structure that we were looking at and we just turned it. Now where's the P orbital? Above and below. That's where my carbocation is. Why is this important? Where do my electrons from my nucleophile go? They go into the orbital. Which part of the orbital? They're equal. Which means? It, could be it will equally be in either one. Which means when we run the SN1 mechanism, we run the potential of two possible products. How do we know that that's a super important thing for us for the end result? Okay, Because what we're saying is that we could get the product where the nucleophile, as I'm drawing it down there, is wedged and we have the product where it is dashed. Is it important for me right now for this reaction? It's a hard question. These are all hard questions. I mean, yeah. If, you went through it all. if I went through it all, of course. Okay. Haven't we, have we not done that enough in this class? Okay. Ochem hates me usually for it because you always talk about wrong stuff. Yeah, half the things I say are typically wrong. We look at the dead ends so that we don't hit those dead ends on an exam. So just because I talk about it doesn't mean it's directly relevant to the instant we're looking at. We get these two possible products out of it, where the nucleophile come in and attack the top versus the bottom. Is it important for me for this particular reaction? You've got a nice aggressive no. So why? Why? <laughs> does it have to do with RNS? Yes, RNS is probably the more difficult way of doing it, but yes, it does have to do with RNS. It has to do with chirality. We would use RNS if it was chiral. Is it chiral? No, why not? It has those two hydrogens. In this particular scenario, both of those attacks still absolutely happen. We still attack we top. We still attack bottom equally. We get those two possible results. But what's the relationship between the structures of those two possible results? What is their relationship? If they're mirror images, they're enantiomers, and that means two different products. Then it matters. Right? And that matters. That's the scissor example. Or they're not chiral, so they can't be either one of them. They're not chiral, which means 
They can't be enantiomers. What is the relationship between them? They're identical. It didn't matter with this particular starting structure because they're identical structures. If we go back to the previous slide where we had an extra methyl group there, do we now have a chiral atom? Yes. yes. Does it matter? Yes. yes. And so now when I run this reaction, I get two products. Right? So this should set up some potential alarm bells because we already said there's multiple ways to run a substitution reaction. We can either run it as we just discussed here or a different way. What you're going to be responsible for doing is looking at a reaction and being like, ha, that's going to go this route, I get two products. Or it goes that route and I get a different answer. So you have to be able to look at the reaction and say, what are the identifying pieces that allow me to say, this is the mechanism I want to do? Okay? Because this mechanism gets me two products and that changes my output. So what do we have to look for? to trigger this mechanism. Well, what's one of the things that forms? What's the thing that formed? True, but the other substitution reaction will also form a bond. That becomes really important, the carbocation. Because that's where the nucleophile could come in from the top or the bottom, and it was equal probabilities for both. Okay? That structure is of critical importance. What if that piece, so we talked about the leaving group, the leaving group needed to be good. If the leaving group was carbon, oh, that was trash, it wouldn't happen. But what about the positive charge? What if the positive charge isn't stable? It doesn't matter how good the leaving group is, if the positive charge isn't stable, it ain't gonna happen. So what makes a positive charge stable or not stable? Okay, and in that scenario, what are you referencing? Yes, having electrons around it. Love it. Like the other bonds that are connected to the positive. Fancy word being substituents. So, oof. Substituents. I think I got it that time. Okay. Are substituents. Okay, do we have a name associated with those things when we have different things around it? It was horribly vague. I was hoping. Are you talking about functional? No. Primary, 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 secondary, tertiary. Yeah. Okay, and I left zero area off. That's absolutely fair. I should include that. Are all of those equal stable, equally stable as carbocations? No. no. Which of them is the most stable? Tertiary. Tertiary is more stable than secondary, is more stable than zero area. Okay. So what does that mean? If I look at my starting material and I go, ah, that is a primary. How do I know that's a primary? What are you talking about? That carbon is connected to two carbons. The one where the chemistry happens is what I need to look at. I don't care if there's a secondary or tertiary in there. I just care where the chemistry is happening. That position is only connected to one carbon. That makes it primary. According to my list, is that a particularly good carbocation? No. no. Okay. Which is where we now need to bring in some content. Okay. We've got to decide what is good enough to run this. Tertiary is good enough. Secondary is good enough. Primary is not. Which means what we can do is look at the substituents on our substrate and we can now start to make predictions about whether this mechanism is a valid one to look at or not. That's powerful. Okay? So we could use that right now to be like, Mike, you picked crap example because that's primary and primary shouldn't happen. Fair, but all I'm trying to do is focus on the chemistry, so ignore that. Okay. What else was kind of important for this? Well, we, we said we have formed that positive charge, right? 
Right? Are there other things that could possibly stabilize that positive charge? Not that I'm color coding or anything for those paying real careful attention. <laughs> could the solvent somehow stabilize a positive charge? What could the solvent supply that would stabilize positive? A negative charge. It could supply some electrons to stabilize that. All solvents? Which solvents would stabilize that negative charge or stabilize that positive charge? Polar solvents would do a good job because the polar solvents, if we look at that bond for a polar solvent, okay, we have a large difference in, well, I don't know why I'm drawing electrons down there, electronegativity. That difference in electronegativity generates a large partial negative and a partial positive. That negative can be used to stabilize that positive. Okay? Do we have more than one polar solvent? Okay. How many solvent classifications do we have? We have three solvent classifications. We have nonpolar, polar aprotic, and protic. Okay. So we do have two polar solvents. Which of those polar solvents is going to give us the better negative? The protic, because that's the largest difference in electronegativity. So what does that mean we could do? Well, we could go back up here to our solvent, and what we would assume the solvent should be would be protic. So if we spent the time to have learned those definitions for protic, we could look now at just a reaction and say, oh, that's a protic solvent. That suggests I should do the SN1 mechanism, which suggests I need to draw two products. Stack upon stack upon stack. You're looking for each of those pieces. Right? There are two other things that we could address. What are those two other things? Red and purple. We've got our leaving group and our nucleophile. Does the leaving group always have to leave? Yeah. So the leaving group ultimately is going to be misleading because the leaving group, regardless of what mechanism you run, has to be good. Right? So looking at the leaving group, really all it's going to do is be like, it's not ready to do the substitution yet. It can't leave. Make it good. Now it can leave. Right? But it's not going to differentiate between the two mechanisms very well. So we can largely ignore the leaving group presence, and we can then shift our focus to the nucleophile. When was the nucleophile important in our substitution? When it supplies the electrons. There's three arrows here. When did it supply the electrons? One of the box. Yeah. Right? That step was where it mattered. Okay? Um, when did I do the substitution? Up here? I would argue the substitution had already happened because the only thing that's changing here is the presence of the hydrogen. Okay. Deciding between, it is really kind of that step. That's when the final substitution happened. But to do this step, what did I have to do first? I had to have the leaving group leave. So there's two steps that are involved really in the substitution, and there's a cleanup. That cleanup can happen before, it can happen after. Okay. But there's two really important steps for the substitution. Which one is the most important? The okay. And this is a hard question to kind of figure out. Okay. This is where an energy diagram comes into play to really help out with us. Okay. And we don't have to stress too much about the energy diagram, but let's go through and say we've got reactants. Okay. If the reaction happened, where do you think our product energy is? Higher or lower? lower. Okay? Because when reactions happen, we go to more stable species. Those stable means lower in energy. 
right? So all we've established so far is reactant and product officially down there. Where would I expect to place that guy? Higher. Higher than what? Than the Why should it be higher than the reactant? Because there's charge on it. Oh, because it's charged. If we now go through and complete our diagram, what we're saying is something along these lines. To go from reactant to intermediate, what must you do? Increase you have to increase the energy until what? A uh, total fair statement, but on the diagram. Until I've increased energy, because here I started at the bottom with yeah. that little red. I've increased the energy to that spot. Do I have intermediate? No. How about here? When is high enough? When the comes. On the diagram. When? This picture right up here in the upper right-hand corner. Everything else is irrelevant. The top of that highest peak. That's a pretty important peak, right? That might be a useful thing if we gave it a name. For those people that took enough chemistry, what name did we give that? And this is where you can get some people being like, oh, God. Yeah, I remember somebody mentioned something about that. It's the activation energy. To, if you took chem 130, it, it shouldn't ring a bell. Okay, that's the activation energy. Okay? To go from the intermediate to the product, what do I have to do? I have to add energy also. Yes, so here I am starting at the intermediate. Now what do I do? So I, I went up a little. To, okay, to that maximum. So I have another maximum there. The difference in energy there is this. That becomes the activation energy to do that. Blue is our second step. Red is our first step. Which one of those steps do you think is holding back this reaction the most? The red one, because it has a larger activation energy. Why does it have such a large activation energy? We're going from a neutral structure to... Charge, you mean that whole charge that, oh yeah, that comes into play again. The next step is easier because we're going from a charge structure to a still charged-ish. Charged There's some secondary things that we could look at that isn't worth trouble, okay? But less charged, which is why we're dropping in energy. Why is this important to me? Oh God, we gotta get somewhere with this, okay? That means the only thing I care about is the first step. When was the nucleophile relevant? The second step. Do I care about how active the nucleophile is? No. Because the nucleophile strength is going to change the activation energy for the blue step. It has nothing to do with the red step. Okay, so that red step does have factors of the leaving group, but again, the leaving group is always good for substitution reactions. What becomes important is the stability of the carbocation. That's going to dictate that first step the most. Okay, but what does this tell us then about the nucleophile? It's not important. Okay, so if I'm looking at this SN1 mechanism, what I want to see is a substrate that is tertiary or secondary. And I want to see a nucleophile that's not... What's a not important nucleophile? What's an important nucleophile? One that's electron negative. Like one, that has, one that is negative. One that is negative would be important because it can share electrons. So what's a not important nucleophile? One that's not negative. One that is not negative. Do we want it to be positive? If it's positive, it doesn't have electrons to share, okay? So when we're looking at the SN1 and we talk about our nucleophile, typically what we're looking at for our nucleophile is a neutral nucleophile, okay? Not important, it's not charged. Because it's neutral, it's gonna have these extra hanger bonds to hydrogen that we're gonna have to deal with later on. That's why we usually have to add in these acid-base steps. 
right? We've identified a lot of big chunks just by breaking down the mechanism, looking at the overall reaction, saying what are all those pieces, okay? You're gonna get me to what I wanted? What this is gonna hit us for is this summary, okay? If we look at a summary, what do we want for the substrate? We want a stable carbocation. Do we care about the leaving group? It's gotta be good. Whatever it is, it should be good. What was a good leaving group? Yeah, so weak base, it's not, I, yeah, I hate that, so make it better. It's electronegative. Okay, it's more electro, why does it need to be more electronegative? Why does that make it good? So that it can stabilize the electrons that it's pulling off, that it's taking with it. The nucleophile should be weak or irrelevant, okay? The solvent, okay? The solvent usually is polar protic because what it's trying to do is to stabilize both the leaving group and the carbocation. So that's where we're bringing in large positives. What does this mean for us? Once I've identified those kind of characteristics for the SN1, I can then look at the stereochemistry. Okay? What's going to happen? We're going to get these two goofy words that come out of it. Or, well, loss isn't all that goofy. Okay? But the other one's goofy. Okay? Loss. If we start with stereochemistry... We will still end with stereochemistry, but we get two products. The mixture of those two products says that the net result is that we have no stereochemistry. Okay? There's no specificity behind it. Okay? What does racemic mean? It is a 50-50 mixture of R and S. Said another way, and antiomers. Okay? That's a fancy way of referencing it. Okay? But it's saying the products that come out are in antiomers. Are there potential complications with this? Yes. This is one I still haven't quite decided if I want to scrub or not. Rearrangements are possible. Um, I don't think we'll talk about rearrangements. Um, which is going to be very challenging, particularly if you're looking stuff up online. They will talk about rearrangements, but I think it's something I, I want to leave out. Okay? But it is a very real complication of it. Carbocations are not stable, so what molecules will do is rearrange the parts to stabilize, to make a better carbocation. How that happens is the rearrangement process. There's a whole set of rules that potentially run with that. Those rules are still charge size, electronegativity, all that fun stuff. It just adds another layer of complication that I don't think we need to stress about. Okay. Um, but you're going to hear reference to that multiple times through the videos, and you'll probably hear reference to it through these slides. Okay. But that's what's going on with it. It's a complication because you have carbocations. Okay, before we look at the SN2, the most important thing for SN1 is a stable carbocation. Okay, that's what dictated everything. So if you're looking at a reaction that you suspect is an SN1, everything you should be doing should be driving towards making a, a better carbocation. I say draw an example SN1 mechanism or an SN1 reaction. The substrate that you should start with should be tertiary, so that when the leaving group leaves, you form a tertiary carbocation. Okay? Leaving group, we just said, kind of not a big deal, it just got to be good. The nucleophile, we don't care about, because that's not the carbocation. The solvent, we care about the solvent, because what does the solvent do? It helps Stabilize the carbocation. Okay? So when we say SN1, the very first thing that should come to your mind is carbocation. Okay? And I will periodically ask this probably starting in next class. I say SN1 and you say carbocation. Okay? Where that would push to in future classes is that when I say carbocation, you should say rearrangements. Okay? We're largely ignoring rearrangements, but what's the part we're not ignoring? The stereochemistry. Okay? 
So when we say SN1, we should be thinking carbocations. Once we know carbocations, we should be thinking that we're getting multiple products. Right? Those multiple products don't have to be racemic, right? They're only racemic if there's a chiral atom. So those are conditional things that we have to watch out for. Is that a question? No. You're just adjusting. Okay. How are we feeling? What happens with SN2? Okay. Well, in SN2, we do it all at once. This simplifies things a lot as far as a mechanism goes. Okay. So if we were to break this down, get rid of all those pieces, okay, what happens? The nucleophile comes in at the exact same instant that the leaving group leaves. So it all happens at once. Okay? If it all happens at once, I need to be thinking about how these things are happening. What is the leaving group leaving with? Electrons. Okay? So if I have my hand, here's my leaving group, the pen, okay? and I want to bring in another pen. Okay? Here's my nucleophile. Okay? If this all happens at once, can I have the nucleophile come in and do this? I just did it with my hands. How hard can it be? What did each of those pens represent? Electrons. electrons. What happens when I bring those electrons near each other? They repel, they repel which means that's not going to happen. I can't have the nucleophile come in at the exact same location that the leaving group is leaving because there's an electron cloud repelling it away, preventing that from happening. Where does this other pen have to come in to boot that other pen out? It has to come in from directly opposite. And directly opposite, we would reference as backside. Okay? And the most common phrase that comes out of it is backside attack. Okay? So when I say SN2, you say backside attack. Because that now establishes all the other chemistry that comes after it. That nucleophile has to come in from the backside. Right? Which means if this leaving group was wedged, where's the nucleophile? Ah, dashed. Could it also be wedged? No. Interesting. Which means when we run the SN2 mechanism, what happens? How many products do we get? Rhymes with what we're having right now. Fair. <laughs> Not the word I was looking for. You get one. Oh. The SN2 will only produce one product. Because it's all happening at once from the backside. Only one product can come out of it. There's only one place that it can come in and react. I only get one result. The SN1, because we formed that carbocation that had a P orbital above and below, there were two places it could react, both above and below on the P orbital. The SN2 can only come in from the backside. It only produces one product. Awesome. Okay. So we now know the complication. We get one product. If it was wedged in the starting material, the answer must be dashed, which means our stereochemistry inverts. We go from R to S or from S to R. Most commonly, and I think that's how I'll test on it. I should be closer to the recording. Right? What else do we need to worry about? We just talked about, or we just talked, we didn't talk about that. We just said the nucleophile come in, happened all at once, backside, which means how many electrons do I want on the backside? The nucleophile has to come in from the backside. How many electrons should be on the backside if this negative nucleophile is going to make it in? I want none. I want the fewest possible electrons back there as possible. Okay? What kind of substrate would that be? It's not a carbocation. Remember, there's no positive charge. What was our ranking for carbocations? What do we say for our substrates? We had zero, primary, secondary, tertiary. What was the difference between those? 
There's a leaving group. Tertiary is this. There's our leaving group. Zero area is this. How are they different? Tertiary forms a more stable carbocation. I didn't care about carbocations because there's a backside attack. What is the difference? Carbon versus hydrogen. Tell me the difference between carbon and hydrogen. Yes, electronegativity is more fundamental than that. I like where you're looking, Jennifer. And then you looked away. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, carbon has more electrons than hydrogen, which means what's on the back side of the tertiary? A lot of electrons. Can the nucleophile make it in? Nope. Ah, so it flips. So what does that mean? When we look at the SN2, zero area reacts, reacts faster than primary, which reacts faster than secondary, reacts faster than tertiary. Okay. Again, we'll establish a line. What is that line? Tertiary doesn't react. Okay. So that's cool. We can now see a difference between looking at our substrates, whether we get SN1 or SN2. In most scenarios. No, there's one big problem. The secondary reacts in both. That makes things more complicated. Oh, well, look at that. And I pop in a perfectly looked at my clock to see that we're done. Okay. AR for two assignment due tonight. Um, you're supposed to sign up for whatever functional group you have. But you didn't see anybody else's name, so you were nervous? No, there was one other person. Oh, okay. But then it also says um, your acknowledgement on it. So um, you're right. The AI project is, I guess, officially due tonight. Um, you're supposed to pick a functional group and do something similar. So take whatever you submitted initially, okay, what you were interested in, and now what we want to see is how organic chemistry ties back to that. So pick a functional group. I really want a spread of functional groups, ideally. Um, so look at that sign up and see if there's one that hasn't been selected. If there hasn't, if the one hasn't been selected, try one of those and see how it works. If it doesn't work, send me an email saying, hey, AI is not giving me a connection. You're good. Um, uh, and then just find a functional group that does connect. I provided some feedback to kind of help guide you a little bit, yeah. so. Um, I was trying to figure out like, what cluster reaction. So that because it's mostly like doesn't go to bioactive. Um, it's mostly 